So Trump comes out. And he gave a press conference about all these things, about how well he and McConnell are getting on. Obviously, like politicians do, they're getting together to make a push on tax reform. They don't want any personal feud to get in the way. But during the press conference, Trump was asked about the fact why he hadn't gotten in touch with the families of four U.S. soldiers, I think they were Green Berets, who were killed in Niger, uh, October 4th, the Taliban killed them. And so here, he, he made this remark, and this is just a little part of the press conference, but I want to bring it up because of the press reaction. Uh, can, do we have that cut? The traditional way, if you look at uh, President Obama and other presidents, most of them uh, didn't make calls, a lot of them didn't make calls. I like to call when it's appropriate, when I think I'm able to do it. Uh, they have made the ultimate sacrifice. So generally, I would say that I like to call. I'm going to be calling them. I want a little time to pass. I'm going to be calling them. I have, as you know, since I've been president, I have. Uh, but in addition, uh, I actually wrote letters individually to the uh, soldiers we're talking about, and they're going to be going out either today or tomorrow. Yes. So the press, I mean, the, the left goes nuts. And of course, here's, here's just like an example, all right? Several form of a aides of Obama weighed in immediately. Former White House Deputy Chief of Staff Alyssa Mastromonaco called it <clears throat> an effing lie to say Obama and other past presidents hadn't called the families of fallen soldiers. He's a deranged animal, she said. Play the, you know, Donnie Deutsch was on TV. He's a commentator. I I'm playing this not because it's uh, uh, offbeat. I'm playing it because it is typical of the reactions. Instead of saying, no, I haven't called them yet, and I'm going to call them, basically did the reprehensible, disgusting, soulless thing, callous thing of the lying that these past presidents hadn't done it. This is, did we elect the worst person on this planet? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm being serious. Like, every time you think he can't go lower, I, I practically want to cry. I, I want to cry. It's not weak. It's not, this is not about politics. And he's, he, there's something so deeply wrong, evil, soulless, about this person that's got his hand on the switch. And <laughs> now, all of the articles say Trump makes a false assertion that Obama did. He didn't say that he never did. He said that he, he you know, didn't always. He, they don't. Presidents don't routinely call. The, they couldn't possibly. They write them form letters that are personally signed. They have all done this. Uh, everything he said was absolutely in keeping. It, it seems like it seems like it took him a little long. Like if they were killed on October fourth, it took him. A, he said the letters are going out, but it, it seems like it may be he didn't get to it fast enough. I mean that's that is, uh, you know, un, unfortunate if that's true. But this in, this is the hatred that just came through bubbling, bubbling up. So anyway, this whole thing, the whole press conference was interesting to me because. It's basically an answer to Steve Bannon, who is waging, you know, Steve Bannon always thinks of everything as war. He's waging war against the GOP establishment, and he's going to primary everybody. He was at that Values Voters, the Family Research Council does this Values Voters Summit. Uh, Bannon was there, and he was giving a fiery speech about how, you know, he was going to take back Congress from guys like Mitch McConnell and he, by primarying them with, you know, his own candidates. And here's just a part of that speech. You're free men and women in the greatest republic in the history of Earth. And, and why, why are we nationalist? It's not ethno-nationalism. These guys can run that drill all they want. It's economic nationalism. It doesn't matter what your race is, your ethnicity, your gender, your religion, your sexual preference. It doesn't matter does not matter. As long as you're a citizen of this republic, that's what matters. Yeah. Economic nationalism is what binds us together. Economic nationalism and understanding we're going to bring those jobs back. It's not the second law of thermodynamics why they left. There's no inexorable law that took those jobs to Asia and those factories to Asia and left us with gutted communities of opioid addicts. So that, that's Bannon, you know, on the war path against what he calls the GOP establishment. I, I just want to point out, though, that this value uh, voter summit, the uh, 
Family Research Council was deemed a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center, a hate group that has dedicated itself to calling conservatives hate groups. And a lot of the press, on you know, just in this theme of press hatred, a lot of the press was like Bannon, because Trump was also there. Trump and Bannon speak to hate group. Trump is first person to speak, speak to hate group. All baloney. I mean, there are conservative Christians. I don't agree with everything the Family Research Council says, but they are conservative Christians just putting forward that point of view. They are not a hate group in any way. And you could hear them applauding, these are conservative Christians, when Bannon is saying, doesn't matter if you're gay, doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, they're applauding. They're saying, yeah, well, that's right, you're an American. Okay, so here's what I like. Trump, Trump before, the thing about Trump is Trump is becoming a politician, but he's just, he's so blunt that he's not really as good at being a politician as some of these more subtle guys. And sometimes the bluntness is great, sometimes it's not so great. But before lunch, he was asked about Bannon being on the warpath. Okay, so this is, I guess, the first, yeah, the first one is uh, number two. Well, Steve is very committed. He's a friend of mine, and he's very committed to getting things passed. I mean, look, I, I have, you know, despite what the press writes, I have great relationships with actually many senators, but in particular with most Republican senators. But we're not getting the job done. And I'm not going to blame myself, I'll be honest. They are not getting the job done. We've had health care approved, and then you had a surprise vote by John McCain. Uh, we've had other things happen, and... Uh, they're not getting the job done. And I can understand where Steve Bannon's coming from, and I can understand, to be honest with you, John, I can understand where a lot of people are coming from, because I'm not happy about it, and a lot of people aren't happy about it. Okay, so he understands what, this is before lunch with, with uh, Mitch McConnell. He understands where Bannon is coming from, and he's really annoyed at the Congress, and it's not his fault, it's the Congress's fault. Then he has lunch, they kiss, they talk, they play footsie under the table. Then after lunch, they ask him, this is an amazing press conference, by the way. Well, let's just play this. After lunch, they ask him, and he changes his tune just a little bit. It's cut four. Well, I have a very good relationship, as you know, with Steve Bannon. Uh, Steve's been a friend of mine for a long time. I like Steve a lot. Uh, Steve is doing what Steve thinks is the right thing. Some of the people that he may be looking at, I'm going to see if we talk them out of that, because, frankly, they're great people. <laughs> so now, now he's going to, now you're going to talk to Steve Bannon, maybe help out uh, Mitch McConnell a little bit. This was an amazing press conference, by the way, because it was... In, it was 40 minutes long, and the press, he just let the press shout questions at him for 40 minutes and answered every question. The guy is... He is the most transparent president in my memory. I mean, I've never seen a president so open to talking to the press, and it was fairly it was fairly friendly. I mean, it was not the press screaming the way they sometimes do, and it was not Trump insulting them constantly. It was it was pretty pretty friendly. So Mitch McConnell stepped up too, and they were both you know he, now Trump is just loves Mitch McConnell, and I, I we should play the cut of uh, Trump number nine. This is Trump saying now we're, we're the greatest of friends. Now it must have been a fantastic lunch. I mean it's. A, but we've been friends for a long time. We are probably now, despite what we read, we're probably now, I think, at least as far as I'm concerned, closer than ever before. And uh, the relationship is very good. We're fighting for the same thing. We're fighting for lower taxes, big tax cuts, the biggest tax cuts in the history of our nation. Okay, so now they're the best of friends. And Mitch McConnell got up, and he, he had the big thing about Bannon that he just didn't think. He pointed out that when they sent up the Tea Party candidates last time, they all got smushed. Because what happens with Tea Party candidates is they can win in Congress where you're trying to win a small constituency, normally kind of uh, homogenous, all the people in that little area you know, have the same kind of politics. But when you send them up on the national stage trying to win in the Senate especially, it becomes much harder. And so Mitch McConnell, listen to how Mitch McConnell actually sounds a little like Trump here. You know, the goal here is to win elections in November. Back in 2010 and 2012, we nominated several candidates, uh, Christine O'Donnell, Sharon Engel, Todd Akin, Richard Murdoch. Uh, they're not in the Senate. And the reason for that was that they were not able to appeal to a broader electorate in the general election. Uh, my, my goal is the leader of the Republican Party in the Senate is to keep us in the majority. Uh, the way you do that is not complicated. You have to nominate people who can actually win because winners make policy and losers go home. We changed the business model in 2014 
We nominated people who could win everywhere. We took the majority in the Senate. We had one skirmish in 2016. We kept the majority in the Senate. So our operating approach will be to support our incumbents and in open seats to seek to help nominate people who can actually win in November. See, I like that. Winners make policies, losers go home. It sounds just like Trump. Is <laughs> all this talk about the Civil War and Bannon and all this, this, these things, Trump, Trump was also at this values thing. And he, he was asked at this presser, this is a long cut, but I want to play it. He was asked about the possibility of Hillary running for in 2020 and his his answer is first of all trumpian and hilarious i mean when when trump becomes trump there's nothing funnier in politics he's he is hilarious and he just eviscerates her but you can see he's actually considering this and thinking out loud listen to what he says oh i hope hillary runs is she going to run i hope hillary please run again go ahead <laughs> i think she's wrong look when they take a knee, there's plenty of time to do knees, and there's plenty of time to do lots of other things. But when you take a knee, she, well, that's why she lost the election. I mean, honestly, it's that thinking that is the reason she lost the election. When you go down and take a knee or any other way, you're sitting, essentially, for our great national anthem. You're disrespecting our flag, and you're disrespecting our country. And the NFL should have suspended some of these players for one game, not fire them, spend them for one game. And then if they did it again, it could have been two games and three games and then for the season. You wouldn't have people disrespecting our country right now. And, and if Hillary Clinton actually made the statement that in a form sitting down during the playing of our great national anthem is not disrespectful, then I fully understand why she didn't win. I know. I, I mean, I mean, look, there are a lot of reasons she didn't win, including the fact that she was not good at what she did. But I will tell you, that is something that I had just heard about. And I think that I think that her statement in itself is very disrespectful to our country. I mean, that that is a brilliant Trumpian moment. I mean, that is Trump at his Trumpiest. And you could hear them trying to cut him off. They don't want him to go on. And this is, the, you know, you watch watch CNN, watch Don Lemon do an interview. When that kind of truth comes down the pike, they lose the connection at CNN. It's just, oh, we have a technical difficulty. We I mean, every single time you could hear them trying to cut him off. They don't want to let him. He's the president of the United States. You let him finish a sentence. Obama used to go on and on and drone and drone and filibuster. They never interrupted him, but they're desperate to try and stop him because this is the key to the Trump presidency. And by the way, is it cynical? You bet it is. I mean, uh, you know, Trump knows he's got, he's on the he's caught the tail of the dragon and he's going to fly it right out of town. You know, and he's here. I just want to play this one last cut. This is not at the press conference. This is him at the Value Voters Summit. Now he's talking, to, right? This is this guy who goes who spent his life grabbing women. He's been divorced, married and divorced. We know he's cheated on his wives, all this stuff. And remember when they would ask him during the election about God and he knew nothing about uh, the God or religion and all this stuff. Now he's talking to these people and they love him. They love him. And he's playing them like they're a fiddle. Listen to this. In America, we don't worship government. We worship God. The American founders invoked our creator four times in the Declaration of Independence. Four times. Yes. How times have changed, but you know what? Now they're changing back again. Just remember that. We are stopping cold the attacks on Judeo-Christian values. You know, we're getting near that beautiful Christmas season that people don't talk about anymore. <laughs> they don't use the word Christmas because it's not politically correct. You go to department stores and they'll say Happy New Year and they'll say other things and it'll be red. They'll have it painted, but they don't say, well, guess what? We're saying Merry Christmas again. <laughs> So I just the people, the reactions of people at this thing. Here's Pat Flynn from Catholics for Freedom of Religion. It's like a cloud has lifted. When Obama was in, everything was sad. Nothing was good. Now look, look at the smiling faces. Look at people getting jobs again. Another uh, 
This, no, this is still Flynn, sorry. We tried nice guys. We had John McCain, Mitt Romney. They were nice, smiling at everybody, but they couldn't beat Hillary. Romney, I mean, come on. The only thing people remember about him is that he tied a dog to the roof of his car. And all I'm saying about Trump is that he is moving the Overton window. You know, you've heard of the Overton window, right? This is the, it's the window of acceptable conversation. What is this acceptable to say? And he is moving the window back to where it's traditionally been, back to talking about patriotism as if it were a good thing. Remember, you know, how un uncomfortable they were during the Bush years, un how uncomfortable the press was with saying the word uh, um, patriotism. Katie Couric says, oh, I'm uncomfortable with patriotism. I'm uncomfortable saying the word God, talking about Christmas. You know, and, and is there an element of cynicism in Trump? Yes. But I do believe there's also an element of affection for these people. You know, Bill Kristol, who has been a never Trumper ever, he, he put out a tweet today I like Gorsuch, and it's not just Gorsuch anymore. It's an entire panoply of, of, of conservative judges that Trump has been appointed. But he says, I like Gorsuch. I like decertifying Iran, the Iran deal. I like leaving UNESCO. Trump started got, got out of UNESCO because they're anti-Semitic. But all those victories are not worth the degradation of our public life that is the Trump presidency. I mean, it's like champagne conservatism, you know? I mean, this is something This is something that Trump is doing that is ringing in the minds of the people. And I think you're going to start to see it in his approval ratings as the people start to see that these ideas can win. And, you know, I have all kinds of problems with Trump, his cynicism, his rudeness, all this stuff. But, but this needs to be done. This is something that has to happen.